forward and lead our minds in our opening prayer. You bow as we pray. Our Holy Father, we're so thankful that you've blessed us, we're, that we're able to assemble together. We're thankful for this privilege and this opportunity. Father, we're thankful for the way that you've blessed each of us individually and as a body here. We're so thankful, Father, that you so loved us that you gave your son that he came to this earth to die for us that our sins might be forgiven. Father, we have so many here who are sick in some way. We ask, Father, that you would be with them. We we love them and we're concerned about them. And we pray, Father, that you would bless them in a way that they'd be able to recover and have better health. Father, we thankful that you continue to bless us and we're thankful for the leadership that we have here. We pray that you would bless them, give them wisdom that they might lead the congregation in a way that you would have them to go. Father, we are thankful for the ones who bring the lessons from time to time, for Mike and Andy. We're thankful, Father, for the ability that you've given them, and we're thankful, Father, that they've chosen to use that ability to preach your word. Father, we ask that you would be with Mike this morning as he brings the lesson. Give him the remembrance and the things that he has prepared and help us as listeners that we might take those things in our hearts. Father, we ask that you would be with us as we worship you this morning. We pray, Father, that we would do only those things which would be pleasing in your sight. Father, we ask now that you would forgive us of our sins. If we know, Father, that we oft times sin. Father, go with us as we through, continue through this service and be with us always in Jesus' name. Amen. privilege to be able to assemble and to be able to sing uh, this morning on the first day of the week. We're up number 526, number 526. And I know it's not the norm, but if you would stand with me as we sing number 526, this world is not my home, number 526. <clears throat> sing with me. This world is not my home, it is the passing through, my treasures are laid up.
Be seated. Number 194. Number 194. One hundred and ninety-four, sweet by and by. <clears throat> There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar. For the Father waits over. To prepare us a dwelling place there in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by. minds for Lord's Supper number 228. We'll see number 228, the old rugged cross, to prepare our minds for the taking of the Lord's Supper. 228. <clears throat> Sing all four verses of 228. On a hill far away
Romans 5, 8 tells us while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is one of the cornerstones of Christian faith. Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and on the third day he arose from the grave. We partake of this memorial feast every first day of the week to remember this most wonderful sacrifice. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Luke 23 and 23. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and one on the left. Let our minds now go back to Calvary, where Jesus died for our sins. Let us offer thanks for the bread. Father, we're thankful for this bread. May we take of it in a manner pleasing to thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Father, we are thankful for this cup. May we partake of it in a manner pleasing to thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
This concludes our memorial item of our worship. Now we turn to another New Testament item of our worship. And that is giving. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. We're to give as we've been prospered and in a cheerful manner. In Christ's name we pray. Now we offer thanks. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the opportunity to give back to thee, which you so richly blessed us with. May we take, take this opportunity and without grudge and, and give back to thee cheerfully. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Number 257, 257. <clears throat> it's in the first and the fourth verse of 257. Sing with me. When I survey the Go ahead and mark number 218. And at the conclusion of the lesson this morning, we'll sing number 218 as a song of invitation. Number 218. And before the lesson, we'll sing number 446. Number 446. <clears throat> Living by faith, number 446. And ask if it's convenient for you to stand with me again as we sing number 446 before Mike brings us the lesson. Four hundred and forty-six. I care not today what the morrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruleth o'er everything, and all of my worry is vain. Living by faith in Jesus above, trusting confide.
I was sitting in a graduate level class at Fried Hardeman University, sitting at the feet of a mentor, a friend, and a professor, a scholar in every real sense. We were simply talking about Jesus, I say simply. When he asked those of us preachers in that class this question, he said, can you, should you, have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? And there were 13 or 14 of us, all gospel preachers, all graduates of Fried Hardeman University, continuing our education, and to the man, not one of us dare speak. You see, we were afraid to speak up. I was. Because the dominant denominational idea then as well as today go something like this, have a personal relationship with Jesus. And we'd heard that used and abused so long, so often, that we were afraid to be identified with that ideology. And so we said nothing. And he looked at every one of us. And in a very firm and yet loving voice, he looked us in the eye and said, you better have a personal relationship with Jesus. Turn with me to John chapter 14. And notice and mark and underscore in your Bible. John chapter 14 and verse 23. Jesus said, and he answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, He will keep my word, and my Father will love him. Now hold your finger right at that spot. And back up to verse 15. Because in verse 15, he says the same thing. He said, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. Now watch what he says. And he answered and said to him, if you love me, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Now, underscore the little English word in your Bible, H-O-M-E, home. Because literally it means residence. Jesus said we love him and we express that love by obedience. And when we obey him, his father loves us. Of course, he loves us whether we obey or disobey. He loves us all the time. But watch the difference. He says he God the Son, and He, God the Father, will make their residence with us. They will make their home with us. They will have a, and we will have with them, a personal relationship, a family. Now, in John chapter 14, He tells us that that is available But in John chapter 15, he begins to describe what is involved in that relationship with God the Son and God the Father. I want to 
want to notice one verse this morning. One verse. And I want you to move up to John chapter 15 and verse 1. And we'll discuss this morning a part of the lesson. And then this afternoon we'll look at verse 2. What's involved in a personal relationship with the Lord? What does it mean for God to make his home with us? And Jesus tells me. In John chapter 15 and verse 1, he makes this astounding statement. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser, the husbandman. I want you to notice, number one, when we try to answer the question, what does it mean to have a personal home relationship with the Lord? It means an intimate connection with the true vine. Now, I want you to notice something that perhaps went over your head. And if you're not careful, it'll do this. You'll read the passage and it'll go, and you'll miss it. He said, I am the true vine. But this is actually the seventh and the last time in the book of John that Jesus uses that phraseology, and you must not miss it. In John chapter 6, he said, I am the bread of life. In John chapter 8, he said, I am the light of the world. In John chapter 10, he said, I am the gate. In John chapter 10, he said, I am the good shepherd. In John chapter 11, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. In John chapter 14, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And now in John chapter 15, he says, I am the true vine. Now go back in your Bible to Exodus chapter 3. Because in Exodus chapter 3, Moses is tending sheep. He's an aged shepherd. And while he's tending sheep, he comes in contact with the Lord. And in Exodus chapter 3, verse 2. You ready for this? This is so exciting. I can't wait to tell you this. Verse 2 of Exodus chapter 3, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him, Moses, in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. Now watch it. Moses is tending sheep. There's this bush that is on fire, but it's not being consumed. And out of his natural curiosity, he goes to see, to inquire, to see what this is all about. But the angel of the Lord meets him. The bush burned with fire, but it was not consumed. Moses said, I'll now go turn aside and see this great sight. So when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. He tells him in verse 5 to take off his sandals because he's in the presence of the holy God. And he, he's on holy ground. And he's afraid to look. Verse 8, I have come down to deliver them, the Israelites, out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Moses is told, you are to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. You're to go to the people. And then you're to go to Pharaoh. Verse 11, Moses said, uh, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Stay with me. Verse 12, he promises, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign. Verse 13, Moses said to God, who's he speaking to? Well, verse 2, he speaks to the angel of the Lord. Who is the angel of the Lord? He's the Son of God, Jesus incarnate. No, not incarnate. He's not put on flesh. He is the pre-incarnate Christ. And Moses meets Jesus here in the wilderness. And watch the question. The Lord says, I'm going to send you to Pharaoh. Moses said to God, indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, well, what's his name? Who sent you 
Who's told you that you're to go to Pharaoh? Who has put you in charge? Verse 14, and God said to Moses, I am. And you tell them in verse 14, I am has sent me. Now watch it. Jesus said in John chapter 7, I am, I am, I am, I am, I am, I am, I am. What is he saying here? The same Jesus that was present in Exodus chapter 3 is now in John chapter 15 and he said, I am the true vine. Watch it. What does it mean to make our home or God to make his home with me? It means I am in an intimate relationship with the true vine, the son of God. I'm connected to Christ. He's made his home in my life. Now, here's something that you may have never considered. When Jesus says, I am the vine, he didn't say that. He said, I am the true vine. And what's interesting is when you go to the Old Testament, you discover that the vine was always used in reference to Israel. Look with me in your Bible. For example, in Psalms, Psalms 80 and verse 8. <coughs> Excuse me. Psalm 80 and verse 8. You, God, have brought a vine out of Egypt. Well, who did he bring out of Egypt? He brought Israel, the vine. You have cast out the nations and you've planted it. Planted who? Planted Israel. Israel's the vine. Cross-reference that in your Bible and go with me now to Isaiah chapter 5. And we see it again, but from a different perspective. And in Isaiah chapter 5, he's more specific here. It's a word of rebuke and condemnation. Judgment, perhaps, is the word I want to use. Isaiah chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of of my beloved regarding his, the Lord's, vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard. What's the vineyard? Who's the vineyard? He dug it up. He cleared out the stones. He planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst. And he also made wine presses in it. He expected it to bring forth grapes. God has blessed Israel. He's delivered them out of Egypt. He has brought them into the promised land. He's cleared out all of the problems using the judges and the kings. And he's planted them here high up on Zion. And he says he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done to my vineyard that I have not done to it? Well, that's a rhetorical question. He hadn't. Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now, please, let me tell you what I'll do to my vineyard. I'll take away its hedge. It'll be burned. I'll break down its wall. It'll be trampled. There's... A prophecy of what's going to happen to Jerusalem, to Israel. Go with me over to Jeremiah and we see it again. In Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 21, Jeremiah says, Yet I had planted you a noble vine, a seed of highest quality. How then have you turned before me into a degenerate plant for an alien vine? Now watch it. In the Old Testament, Israel is the vine. It's the vine. It's the, Isaiah says, the disappointing vine. Jeremiah says it's the degenerate vine. Here's the point. God planted her and she did not become what he wanted her ultimately to be. And the troubling question for those of the Old and the New Testament and for us would be, well, if Israel didn't fulfill 
if, if she didn't do what God wanted her to be, is that the end? Is there no hope? And that's what Jesus says, oh no. Because he says, watch it, there is hope for mankind. There is hope for God's people. Why is that? Because he says in John chapter 15 and verse 1, I am, I am the true vine. I'm the one and only. I'm the true vine. See, what does that imply? It means I am connected to deity, the Son of God. Now, what does that imply? What does that mean to me? One more passage. Go with me over to Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5 and watch the implications of this. In Hebrews 13 and verse 5, the writer says, Let your conduct be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. Now watch the latter part of the verse. This is exciting. For he himself has said, watch it. You all with me? I'm glad you're reading, but listen. Let your conduct be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Watch it. I will never leave you. See, not only does it mean when it, when it says, I, uh, Jesus said, I am the true vine, that I am connected to the true vine. But it means because I am connected to Jesus Christ, because I'm connected to God the Father, listen, he will never leave me. Has your spouse been unfaithful to you? Jesus says, I am and I will never leave you. Has your job left you and have you been fired? Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The Lord is my helper. What can man do to me? Has your best friend betrayed you and let you down and left you all alone? I will never leave you nor forsake you. See, I'm connected to the Lord of Lord and to the King of Kings. I'm connected to the true vine. And he makes his home with me. And I have a, can I say it? Scripturally, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's exciting. What does that mean? It means he'll never leave me. He'll never let me. I'm going to ask you to do something with me. I'm going to put a peg down. And I want to stop and have a prayer. And then I'm going to ask one of our shepherds to come up to the pulpit. Let's bow together. Father in heaven, may we never forget that you want to make your home with us. May we pursue relationship with you and your son. May we never forget that you'll never forsake us. That you'll always be there. And Father, if there's any in the assembly today who have not obeyed the gospel, they need to be connected to you. I pray that they'll do it today. I pray, Father, that if we have fallen into the trap of going through the ceremony of attendance and worship and coming to church and we've stopped being the church, that you'll remember and remind us, rather, of the personal relationship that we can have with you. Father, as we pursue 2019, we pray, Father, We'll never forget we're connected 
to the vine dresser, you, and to the vine, your son. In your son's name we pray. And amen. Ants, come on up. And then I'm going to conclude with one.